Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Abdi, and I am the Marketing and Communications Lead at Parallel Flight, and I will be the moderator for this session. The title of our webinar today is Wildfire Drones and the Latest Tech. I'm really excited to take this next hour to chat with Joshua Resnick, the CEO and co-founder of Parallel Flight, <clears throat> as well as industry experts, Mark Bathrick, retired director at the U.S. Department of the Interior Office of Aviation Services, and Ben Miller, director of the Colorado Center of Excellence for Advanced Technology Aerial Firefighting. This is going to be a jam-packed discussion on the latest in fire tech, which is going to include topics like autonomous aerial systems and the future of fire response and search and rescue operations, as well as public safety and everything in between. As a reminder, we would like this to be an interactive discussion. So if you have any questions for Joshua, Mark, or Ben, you can type them into the Q&A box. <clears throat> Time permitting, we're gonna do our best to answer as many of these questions. Now, I would like to formally introduce our guests. Joshua Resnick brings a passion for ground-breaking technology and years of hybrid and electric powertrain expertise to parallel. Prior to Parallel, he led system architecture and electrical engineering for the Tesla semi-truck program. Before moving to California, he led state-funded research for the state of Alaska, developing hybrid electric commercial fishing boats. When he's not designing the future, Joshua enjoys flying RC helicopters and hiking with his family. <clears throat> Mark Bathrick, recently dubbed the Drone Meister, is a retired senior executive who developed and directed the U.S. Department of the Interior's award-winning Drones for Good program. He recently retired as the director of the Office of Aviation Services for the department. He is recipient of the 2017 Commercial Drone Alliance Industry Heroes Award and was listed in 2018 by Commercial UAV News as a top seven drone visionary. Mark is also a Top Gun graduate and former test pilot for the Navy with 30 years of UAS testing, acquisition, management, and operations experience. Ben Miller serves as the director of the Colorado Center of Excellence for Advanced Technology Aerial Firefighting. Ben's team focuses on the fire service, but is also solving problems for public safety UAS uses by creating solutions for real-time geospatial intelligence sharing, counter UAS management of the airspace above wildland fire, fires, and numerous other public safety related challenges. Ben is regarded as a thought leader on the applications of small unmanned aircraft in public safety. I'd like to invite each of our guests up onto the stage. Hi, Joshua Hello. and Mark and Ben. Great to have all of you guys here today. So I think as a starting point, I'd like for each of you to take this moment to share more about your respective roles, what you build, any initiatives. Um, so Joshua, let's go ahead and start with you. First of all, uh, I am extremely honored to have Mark and uh, ben joining us for this webinar. Unlike a lot of our webinars, uh, this is not uh, an investment fo focused webinar. This is, an, this is really a, a public good webinar, almost like a public service where we can share the latest in the industry uh, with everybody. Um, as all of you know, or as, as many of our audience members know, I am the CEO of Parallel Flight Technologies and one of its three co-founders. And we're de developing heavy lift autonomous systems that are, and we're focusing on the tactical resupply missions for firefighting and large scale prescribed burns. And we'll talk more about that once we get into the, the discussion. And over this journey, you know, because I'm, I'm an engineer, not a firefighter, uh, this journey uh, in building parallel, I've, I've had to learn a great deal about the firefighting and, and work with the firefighting community. And I've been honored uh, even from from really the, the early days of PFT to work with with Mark and uh, get his input into what we're building and, and the way we're approaching the market. So that's been uh, super vital for us. And and now I'm really honored to be able to, you know, to have 
him uh, share with the community some of the things that he's worked on over the years. Ben, uh, ben and I met more recently, and I'm, I'm really thrilled about the work that's going on at the Colorado Center of Excellence. So I'm, I'm looking forward for Ben to share that with all of you. So without further ado, I'll, we'll, we'll have our other guests introduce themselves and we'll go from there. Uh, Mark, why don't you uh, take the stage? Thank you, Joshua. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you and uh, Perla for the opportunity to, to be here. And I'd also like to thank everyone who's joined with us to uh, engage in this discussion. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I recently retired from the Department of the Interior as Director of uh, Office of Aviation Services, where I spent uh, 16 wonderful years um, working with uh, people a lot smarter than I was. Um, but we're incredibly energized to bring new technology to uh, all of the interior missions, including wildland fire. And uh, with uh, collaboration with industry and our state and local and interagency partners, um, we're able to bring some pretty revolutionary technology to wildland fire, not just um, uh, drones that could pick out hotspots, but could also direct firefighters to those hotspots do precision mapping. And, and probably one of the more revolutionary things uh, we developed was the ability to do prescribed burns, uh, aerial ignition from uh, those drones. Um, that uh, is a very hazardous mission. It's claimed many lives over the course of its uh, history uh, from uh, helicopter crashes and to be able to do that with drones um, and then do uh, burns on fires to use fire in the prosecution of wildfires uh, and do that 24 hours a day. That was really uh, exciting. So uh, now that I'm retired, I, my, I retired from the position, but not from the passion, as I like to say. And so I'm continuing to work with folks to try and move uh, not only drones, but other uh, technologies uh, into the wildland and fire space so we can address this national issue. So thank you. Thanks. I think I'll uh, jump in there. Um, my name is Ben Miller. Um, uh, as introduced, I'm the director of the Center of Excellence for Advanced Technology and Aerial Firefighting. That's a mouthful. Um, you can thank the state legislature of Colorado for that. Um, we began um, in a piece of legislation in 2014 that um, uh, funded, uh, if you will, the beginning of the Firefighter Air Corps um, and really is the beginning of what we would call co-fire, if that were or, or name was probably not trademarked prior to our existence. Uh, very similar to CAL FIRE, uh, we are the state fire agency um, and my organization is the advanced technologies or R&D section uh, within that uh, division. Uh, the division is formally named the Division of Fire Prevention and Control and unique to Colorado, um, uh, we live within the Colorado Department of Public Safety. The approach in Colorado is that uh, fire, especially wildland fire, is really a public safety uh, event now that it's so uh, prominent in the WUI in places where there are lives and values at risk. Um, we approach it from that perspective. Um, our game is really early detection and rapid initial attack. Um, the idea is that if we can find it when it's small, we actually have a chance with the resources that we have available um, to provide some sort of suppression and or containment to that uh, ignition event. Um, and then uh, Hopefully you guys never hear of those fires. Um, as, uh, for an example, last year, uh, a lot of folks said, hey, Colorado season really wasn't that big of a fire season, but we detected more than 200 fires in the state of Colorado. So um, a relative success in the sense that of those 200 fires, you never really heard about many of them. So that's um, what we do. Uh, my team, uh, I, I like the way Mark put that, a whole lot of people uh, a lot more smart than I am. Um, that is totally true. Uh, I really create the space for them to do great things um, and keep people pointed in a, in a productive direction. Um, we work predominantly in the um, real-time resource tracking space, and we'll get into that just a, in a little bit here. But um, yeah, I, uh, we manage the entire unmanned systems program for all of the Colorado, Colorado Department of Public Safety. So that's all our state troopers that fly drones, our state investigators that fly drones, inspectors, et cetera, all go through um, a certification process uh, within our organization. Uh, and then we're always looking for um, new technologies, new applications of unmanned systems. 
And when I say unmanned systems, we don't think of just the things that fly. Um, we're interested in things that crawl, walk, run, uh, drive, and everything. So thank you to Parallel Flight for including us uh, in this event today, and we're excited to be here. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, I Great introductions, and Joshua, I'm going to let you take it from here, but I'm going to pop up a slide on the screen for everyone to take a look at. Um, I think it's a really good uh, depiction, and this came from um, Mark's consulting group. So give me a moment to pop that up, and Joshua, if you want to go from there. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, I noticed in the chat that uh, let's see, it's uh, Spiro Vasiliki from from Greece uh, is greeting us and uh, calling in from Greece, and I think it just kind of underlines that this is a global issue. I think. We're all aware of that, but you know, working with DOI over the years with Mark uh, and and working with the Forest Service and now with Colorado Center of Excellence, you know, these organizations, and then of course Cal Fire as well. You know, these organizations are, uh, but you know, especially especially DOI and and COE, they're really in in a way the tip of the spear, right, when it comes to this new technology because. They're, they're out there trying new stuff, seeing what can be developed. And all of this ends up uh, you know, go, becoming global, right? Because what, what the most advanced fire tech does here ends up becoming uh, used around the world. So I just wanted to um, you know, highlight that. Uh, so anyway, this is a slide that, that Mark put together, which I found to be really, really helpful as a, as a starting point for this conversation, because you know, I think when a lot of people think about fire tech, you know, they're, they're thinking about suppression mostly. They're thinking about that second to last link in this whole chain. And there's really an entire uh, system of links and connections that that the technology uh, and, and new technology can be used and leveraged to to make the whole the whole the whole problem more tractable. So I, I just thought this was a really great place to start. Um, so maybe with that, with that, with that being said, uh, Mark and and then Ben, maybe each of you could talk about some of the technologies that you're most excited about and which parts of this chain they they uh, address. Yeah, thanks, Joshua. So um, first, uh, maybe just a brief uh, discussion of the of the chain. So in aviation, we we often talk about the mishap chain. What, what are the pieces that occur uh, that cause an aircraft to crash? And it was in that vein that I thought of wildfire as a, the chain of events. Because if you, um, as an example, if you, if you mitigate the, the risk through uh, active reduction and elimination of hazardous fuel load, then you might not have a fire at all. Or if you have one, it's, it's far more manageable as, as all the fire professionals know. So to me, um, and as you said, Joshua, all the focus uh, tends to be on the suppression side. And really, if we take a look at te technology uh, across all of these, uh, we would have a, a larger cumulative effect. And, and I like what Ben was saying earlier about the, uh, the unmanned systems on the ground, because I think in the active pre-year mitigation, there are opportunities for uh, those walking, crawling vehicles to perhaps assist in that uh, active uh, reduction of fuel load. Uh, I know there are plenty of projects going on to, uh, to use that kind of technology. So that's just one, one area. Uh, you get to the detection uh, the, of ignitions. Uh, I've seen technologies that use uh, visual heat, um, actually sensing the smoke um, and, you know, it's not just those sensors, but what's really important is the ability to net all of that information. And, of course, now we're talking about um, mesh networks, we're talking about 5G capability, uh, machine learning to understand when you've got a, uh, a true detection uh, versus a false positive. And then artificial intelligence helping, you know, we weak humans understand you know what's a recommended decision and give us the opportunity to perhaps look at that but you know the whole idea is to understand what's going on faster and allow us to respond more quickly so i'll stop there and pass it then 
Yeah, thanks, Mark. I I um I, I kind of the, the place we live is really operational test of new technologies and, and really in that ops space from a fire uh, response perspective. Um, really within the state of Colorado, um, mitigation, risk assessment, et cetera, fuel loading, stuff like that happens within other organizations predominantly. Um, it allows us to really focus on once really the point of ignition and, and everything after that. Um, I, and I really, I was thinking as Mark was speaking, I, I kind of think even um, uh, aerial application of fire um, is even an operational uh, tool, i.e. we use fire to put out fire in a lot of ways. Um, and, and, and reduction of fuels sometimes isn't just a pre-season mitigation activity, but it's a, it's a, you know, within the incident, if you will i.e. we know the fire's direction, it's burning in this area, and there's a safe opportunity to remove some fuels out ahead of the fire. Um, what better way uh, to reduce the risk to staff than to put in a robot in that sense uh, to start those fires? Um, and that's very valuable to us. Um, um, our biggest thing, our focus is, is really a step before all those response technologies. Um, and, and within the state of Colorado, we have a wide range of both detection and response capabilities um, and our detection capabilities really begin with partnerships with the Department of Defense that are that are classified, um, clear up to uh, our own manned aircraft that have uh, the same camera systems as a, a Reaper drone, a, a MX-15 camera ball that that we send out based on detections from that partnership with the Department of Defense. Um, and then we go confirm and, and then we go confirm again and, and kind of keep dialing in technologies and resources um, until we know right down to call it three meter accuracy and a lot long of where that fire's at and uh, and then rapidly communicating that information out to participating organizations that have a response capability, a, a suppression capability so that we can go try to kill that fire before it's, you know, greater than 10 acres. So um, a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Um, and uh, yeah, I, the, Really, the concept is anybody that's been in wildland fire understands very quickly, regardless of your tenure, whether it's two weeks or 20 years, that Mother Nature is a formidable opponent and we really don't have the upper hand. And when the fire is burning in a manner that you've seen it on TV, there's really not a lot we can do. Um, and so that whole uh, focus, if you will, is to find it when it's small, when we as human beings have the upper hand. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, kind of looking at that, that chain again, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we make these fires more manageable? And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things we've really focused on at Parallel Flight is how, you know, is looking at this whole controlled burn space. And, and this is something that's been fascinating for me to learn about because, uh, you know, I've, and I, I encourage everybody to kind of look this up. If you look at pictures of the American West, um, uh, you know, in the in in the late late 1700s, early 1800s, like the, it's a patchwork of forest, not not a blanket of forest, and that's because uh, a lot of the the Native Americans practiced prescribed burning, and now this is something that we're recognizing has to really come back uh, at, at a much larger scale. So we've partnered with a company uh, that called Drone Amplified. And uh, Mark, Mark's worked pretty closely with them. I think Ben, you have too. Uh, and they, they've really led the way with prescribed burning. Um, and they, they've done this with a system that weighs roughly uh, 10 pounds and flies on a, uh, it used to be on a DJI M600, but you know, they're moving to a different platform now. Um, and we're working with them to scale that way up to a system that can ignite up to 2,000 acres per flight on our, our um, Firefly platform. So uh, I'm really excited about the, the, the um, increased renewed focus on prescribed fire and, and how that's gonna you know, hope, hopefully uh, start making the land more manageable um, so that we you know, can avoid some of these mega fires or when fires break out, there's just not as much fuel for them to rapidly blow up so that, you know, you guys can get in there and put the fire out before it gets too big. 
Yeah, so um, I'm going to take this opportunity, I think, to uh, we have some good questions in our Q&A, and this one's actually for Mark, and it, it kind of piggybacks off of what you guys have been discussing. Um, Mark, during your time with the DOI, was has there been any collaboration with the U.S. Fire Administration to bridge the gap between interagency unmanned systems training and resource pool capabilities? Where does that stand today? Yeah, uh, great question. Whoever asked that, thank you. So um, a premise of our, our program when we started developing it was um, uh, sharing. So we share all of, shared all of our information with the public. We shared all of our training with uh, other agencies. I think when I left, we had assisted 21 different state, federal, local agencies build their own programs. And, um, and being in Boise with the National Interagency Fire Center there with all of the, um, actually all the federal and state um, fire agencies are represented on various committees. Uh, we shared all of that, that data and information and experience. And I think that's really important. And the other sharing we did was with industry. You know, uh, industry can't build what you need if you don't tell them what your requirements are. And so we were uh, very adamant to develop detailed requirements and publish those online and they're still posted out there. Uh, and I think that you know, it's much like uh, the, the fire environment. You know, you, you beat fire as a team and, uh, and it's incredibly important. And the events like this, where we get to talk about these things and get questions from folks and, and share ideas, that's, uh, that's all part of that collaboration. And uh, I'm excited to be on this side of the fence now, um, still being involved in that. Speaking of uh, interagency stuff, I, ben, you and I were having a pretty lively conversation yes, or I think it was yesterday about the tax system. Can you can you talk about that a little bit at, for for all of us here? So because I think this is a you know gonna be a real game changer as it gets rolled out. Yeah, you bet. Um so so tax stands for the team awareness kit. Um actually that's what it stands for for us on the civilian side. It began life as the tactical assault kit. Um, and it was a project based out of um, a fratricide event within uh, the Air Force where there was a, a close air support request that came in and unfortunately some folks uh, uh, were injured and a few lost their lives um, uh, on the blue team we'll call it. And so we, they wanted this real time blue force tracker a way to see all the guys on the ground um, from the air. Uh, so when they were providing close air support, they made sure that um, they didn't provide it too close um, and, and, and cost the lives of, of our men and women in the service. So um, the Air Force Research Laboratory created this robust uh, system, if you will. And it includes, we call it ATAC, that's the Android Team Awareness Kit. Um, just recently, as of last week, ITAC is now released um, in the uh, uh, App Store on Apple. Um, ATAC is now found in the Google Play Store. There's even a WinTAC that you can get a hold of. It's not quite in the Windows App Store of, as of yet. Um, but the general idea is a map with dots on it. And those dots are representative of obviously people, um, but also other resources, fire trucks, aircraft, um, and then geospatial related information, i.e. the perimeter of the fire. Um, values at risk in, uh, in the approach of the fire, uh, things like that, things that have a, that matter one way or the other, and then have a spatial component. Um, we talk very well on the radio. Sometimes we don't do very well. We put stress into the uh, environment and, and, and communication breaks down. But for the most part, we do a pretty good job of communicating the situation, if you will, over the radio. Um, I, I would say that public safety communicators are some of the best communicators on the planet, if not the best communicators on the planet. For that reason, identifying what matters, what doesn't matter, and communicating that effectively and efficiently. That said, um, you have to be quite the orator, I guess, in a way, to describe what's happening over the radio, or this is where I'm at and these are the things I need. The where part will now be handled remotely um, through uh, smart devices that we carry in our pockets, on our wrist, on our thigh, um, where we're even working on uh, heads up display 
um, to where it's presented to us on a monocle. But the but the concept of the wear is now described graphically on a device instead of communicated over the radio. And I think that doesn't just change wildland fire and fire. That changes public safety as we know it for the better moving forward. If I could, if I could ask you guys, looking at that whole fire chain from you know from beginning to end, from from the the health of the forest to uh, reforestation at the you know after an event, what what is the weakest link right now in in your guys's view, and and where where do you think the most work should be done? I'll I'll jump in there uh, first, I guess. I I I um can quickly say that eighteen months ago, I might I might put it between dynamic fire risk assessment and timely ignition detection. I think with the advent of our access to space based data, um, we're probably doing a lot better job um, with timely ignition detection. Um, statistically speaking, in the state of Colorado, a, a not so bad fire year last year as opposed to the year prior. Um, 2022, however, has been off to a rough start already. Um, however, uh, we had 200, uh, more than 200 detections within our capability to detect ignition um, in the state in 2021. So we're, we're getting a good handle on that, but I think it breaks down for us at least in between detection and rapid initial attack, we have resources through um, what we own, what we have access to with partnerships with our local uh, stakeholders, as well as our federal partners. Um, that said, uh, moving resources to that point of ignition in a timely fashion has been somewhat of a challenge. And there's multiple reasons for that. The ability to communicate that specific location is one of those. Um, and then obviously the ability to to have resources pre-positioned in a um, effective location to make sure that they're close to where we think fire may happen, et cetera, has been one of the big challenges. Well, I appreciate Ben going first. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, for two thoughts come to mind. First, um, any of the, all the links are important, right? So I think that uh, you have a, you have a vulnerability if you're not looking at all the links because that's one that's not getting attention. I think for my 16 years at Interior, the one that the, the two that vexed me the most uh, were the rapid initial attack and the sustained suppression. And let me explain. Uh, as a as a Navy fighter pilot, I was used to flying 24/7. You know, and many times we would fly at night um, because that was when the enemy was most vulnerable. And uh, yet we are unable to do rapid initial attack and sustained suppression at night, not only at night, but also uh, for extended periods and extended days uh, occasionally when the smoke is too thick in what we call degraded visual environments. Um, I did a study um, of fire ignitions from 2015 to 2017 and found out that 19% of all those ignitions occurred after traditional flying was over. And so you have to ask yourself, what are happening to those fires that were unable to attack. And, and that's why we looked at technologies like optionally piloted helicopters. And, and the same is true for sustained suppression. And if you think about the conditions, um, either at night or when uh, smoke settles in the morning, you know, the temperatures are down, the wind is down, the relative humidity is generally higher than it is in the heat of the day. And so the fire is much more vulnerable. Yet, um, we're unable to uh, do that rapid initial attack and sustained suppression. So there may technologies out there being investigated now that um, will open that up as we did with the aerial ignition and be able to use, as Ben talked about, using that um, actually on active fires to, to combat those fires. So um, very exciting time, but I think that's, those are my two. Yeah, I, I, I've told this story a few times in our webinars at this point, but when we had the CZU complex fire, which was the second fire in the Santa Cruz Mountains to almost destroy my home. Uh, the, the, I think almost for the first week of the fire, there were no air assets because of the smoke inversion. So there was just no, there was no um, uh, clear, um, you, know, you know, it was all, it was all degraded visual environment. So, um, you know, that, that was a major hindrance to the, to the attack. And, and that's one of the things that we're 
very aware of and, and working on. So you know, we've put a very high quality infrared camera on our aircraft to be able to see right through the smoke to the ground. Um, and then obviously, because we're not limited by, um, we're, not, we're not limited by, uh, you know, pilot fatigue, we're not limited by safety issues at night, because there's just no, there's no pilot on board the aircraft, you know, we will be able to fly 24 seven on a fire. Um, so that's, that's a, a capability that we're really excited about. Um, we, we're getting a lot of really great questions from the audience. I think and I want to get to them real soon. There, there's just one thing that I have a question about, and I think it's worth discussing in an open forum like this. One of one of the things that's hindered uh, prescribed burning as a method of uh, reducing fuel loads in our forests is the perceived and or real danger uh, that the public has uh, about those types of operations. I know there's, you know, there, there's an air quality issue that people get concerned about, and then also um, uh, an escape issue where fires can get out, where, where a controlled burn can become an uncontrolled burn. I, while, while I have you both here, and you know, while we're having this kind of open conversation, can you guys speak to those risks uh, so, that, so that, you know, everybody who's here, uh, uh, you know, it, it, as we go back to our, our public lives right like what what you, you know we'll have more information when it comes to making these kind of decisions uh as as these these uh bills come up and as proposals for prescribed burns come up and as communities discuss this we have to really be as well informed as possible so what are the what are the real risks what are the perceived risks how do how do you guys see this question uh since ben went first last time i'll go first this time uh you know obviously there are risk anytime you you start a fire uh intentionally there's a there's a chance that uh, it could go beyond the bounds of what you intended I, I think though uh you know there's um there's not one tool you know there are, are other ways to um to manage uh, fuel load there's a there's mechanical means and so i think you have to look at those risks and there's some areas where uh, it doesn't make sense to use prescribed burns. There are technologies being developed right now that um, use uh, machines that can possibly burn that material and yet capture the smoke and do it in a very controlled uh, environment. And, and in fact, you know, put some water on the um, on the vestiges of what's uh, what's left to preclude the uh, the spread of that fire. So I think that there are. Uh, first, there are tools available in the toolkit now that are alternative to prescribed fire. Obviously, it's, it's very effective um, and uh, it's very inexpensive uh, compared to other mechanical means, but uh, there are those tools out there and there are tools being developed. And before I hand over to Ben, I, I want to emphasize the importance of operations, organizations like Ben's. Um, you know, uh, I had a, a few opportunities in my Navy career to fly in harm's way, um, but we have to understand that every day these firefighters are in harm's way. And so if we're gonna put technology out there, it has to be well proven and it, it has to be out there so that they can train on it. So it's second nature. And, and I know that a lot of folks I talked to are just you know, wondering why the technology isn't out there already. And, and I tell them, you know, when you're standing in front of a 50 foot wall of flames, you don't want something that might work uh, that you haven't trained on extensively. And so organizations like Ben's are really critical to this process. So I encourage industry to, to get involved with uh, organizations like that, make sure their products are well tested and trained to you before they go out in the field. So over to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, 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 I think that's one of the critical value adds that we bring to the game. Um, one, I, I think it's profound that Colorado has had the foresight to create an organization like ours that's full-time. Um, we have a lot of colleagues within, call it the industry, um, if you will, and really none of them are full-time. Um, recently, NASA was looking for partners on a project and they were kind of talking to everybody, Cal Fire, Oregon, Washington State, et cetera. And, and when they came back to us, one of the things they mentioned was that, uh, hey, we like you guys because you're full-time. The advantage of that is you're getting public safety experience um, 
that isn't gone during the season or kind of a, you know, a, it's a, it's a, an addition to their normal duties and they help you when they can and fight fire when, when they can't help you kind of thing. So that, that's a huge value to us. Um, it, it comes with all of the folks that work for me are all previous uh, public safety from, from law enforcement to structure to wildland firefighting. Um, we're all driven in that sense because we, we have been there um, and feel, uh, we still feel the fire front, if you will. Um, and uh, we have the experience, just as Mark put it, to know what, what is um, good, uh, what works, what, what is applicable, what is a solution to an actual problem that exists instead of just a solution looking for a problem, um, which is what we find a lot of times in industry. Um, but, but really, it, kind of getting back a little bit to that prescribed burn um, question, there, there's risk in, in all things that we do. You know, if you risk little, you, you save little. Um, uh, and so that's one of the challenges. Um, but, but, but for perspective, um, in chatting with one of my uh, operational counterparts uh, just the other day, um, and I actually didn't know this, but kind of the average prep time for a large prescribed fire, large uh, fuels reduction operation can sometimes be upwards of three years in the making. And a lot of folks don't know too, you don't schedule the day, you schedule the period, and then you wait for the perfect time of the weather to go do that successfully. Just right outside of my hometown here, they did one just the other day, successfully reduced fuels in about 10,000 acres of oak brush. Um, they uh, pr trained professionals, saw the opportunity, saw the, the weather window and began to ignite. And uh, the operation was very successful. Um, and I think there'll be a long-term impact from the reduction of those fuels. So I think this is a really good segue into one of the questions that we just got. Um, I have recently heard an Amazon delivery zone crashed and caused a 25 acre fire, not to mention the potential of hurting someone. Joshua and fellow panel members, what makes parallel flight not one of those other drones and what can PFT do or has done to not make that happen? So first of all, thanks for the question. I didn't hear about that particular crash or the details surrounding it, but I will definitely check it out. I can tell you what Parallel is doing to avoid those kind of situations. Um, first of all, we are including a ballistic parachute on our aircraft. So this is, this is a really important safety measure, uh, both to protect, first of all, people, to pre you know, prevent uh, any kind of catastrophic uh, breach of the fuel cell, or battery on crash to prevent a fire. We're designing the aircraft so that uh, if, if the ballistic parachute deploys, uh, when it hits the ground, the energy is low enough that it won't, it won't burst the fuel cell or puncture the battery. So, you know, this is, this is kind of an engineering solution. Also, there's uh, multiple redundancies to keep uh, all the propellers spinning, and that's part of our proprietary uh, hybrid technology. So there's a gas and an electric engine or a gas engine and electric motor on each prop. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, safety is obviously our primary concern. That's great. And, and there's another question that kind of piggybacks off of your answer. So as a battery manufacturer from the battery energy perspective, what are some of the needs from your drones that you'd like to see improved upon or offered? Well, you know, for, for our particular technology, you know, as a hybrid drone, the battery plays a much less extensive role than it does in a full-on electric drone. Maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Mark and Ben, who have a lot of this operational experience with battery-powered drones. What kind of things have you guys seen on the battery tech front that you think uh, could be improved upon? I think first, I want a battery that lasts forever, <laughs> okay? Um, I, you know, batteries uh, are uh, obviously a challenge. Uh, the, the longer they last, the less we have to turn them around. Um, the, the faster they charge, that's very helpful. And I think probably one of, you know, our, our program has been, you know, the DOI program has been in place since about 2009. And, uh, and we've had commercial drones uh, since uh, you know, 2014, 15 there. 
And so we're starting to see those batteries, you know, is like your iPhone or, you know, anything else you charge and charge again, it's, it's losing its ability to stay charged. So, you know, any advancements in, in any of those areas of uh, batteries it would be helpful. And I just want to say that, you know, there's never been an aircraft that's gotten smaller as it's gotten older, right? I want an aircraft that'll fly farther and carry more uh, than it did when I first got it. And we're always going to have the expansion. So to the, to the battery question, uh, you know, the, the power, you know, for whatever it's powered by is going to be increasingly important because we're going to want larger drones like uh, Parallel is developing. Uh, so we can carry more um, aerial ignition material or, or more uh, uh, water bottles or, or whatever, uh, retardant suppressant. So um, yeah, advances there. It's just one of the many technologies that uh, we're looking to, to uh, increase our capabilities. Yeah, I, I maybe have an answer that ties a little bit of this battery question in, in the question about the, the Amazon crash together just a little bit. Um, I... I have, I started kind of in the drone space 2008-ish. Uh, uh, I worked at the Mesa County Sheriff's Office and began a program there. Um, Mark was one of the first people um, I called and chatted with early on, uh, back in the day, if you will. And um, uh, then our, our drones flew for seven minutes and we were very excited when we, hey, we got seven minutes and 38 seconds today out of this drone. That was incredible. Uh, and it's really no big deal to land a drone. You know, you're not really doing a beyond visual line of sight operation. You're doing things operationally close to you. Um, not a big deal to land, put another battery in there, et cetera. Um, and, and, and up you go again kind of thing. But, but management of batteries, uh, care of batteries, those types of things can sometimes be challenging. They don't like to be too hot. They don't like to be too cold. Um, when they're done running, they're warm and they have to be a certain temperature before you charge them back up again. And oh my goodness, it takes you seven minutes to em empty that battery, but it takes you an hour and a half to fill it back up again. Um, at, at the end of the day, um, nothing beats dead dinosaurs from a power density perspective, at least in, in the world that we know right now. I'm excited for the day when we discover that alternative. Uh, but the biggest thing I think about um, fossil fuels, at least for right now, for gas, is the fact that that recharge process is about as fast as you can pour it into the tank. And that's a big deal. Um, and so I don't think that gas uh, is the answer to the multi-copter. And we could talk for hours on really what the multi-copter has done for the, really this democratization of aviation um, piece. But it's really made it so that Aviation is available to most public safety users, not just in the United States, but the world. I would venture to say that some data suggests around 90% of public safety organizations in the United States have adopted unmanned systems technology at this point. Um, I think we're beyond really uh, a statistically significant um, crash in safety uh, data conversation where it would suggest that this is an unsafe activity. I think for the ways in which we, we adopt them and use them and the locations that we do, that safety conversation is a little less uh, profound than it used to be. Um, I have, again, a back in the day comment, I have lots of stories of drone demos to interested parties that we had crashes in the demo. Hey, look at this. I, I have literally said, look, mom, no hands. And the very next thing that happened is the drone fell out of the sky. Um, so the, the world is a different place. Um, I'm, I'm with Mark. I would love a battery that lasted forever. I would actually really love a battery that might not last forever, but charges in an instant, right? So it's very fast. I can, is basically in, an, in the amount of time it would take me to fill a gas tank, maybe I have a charged battery again, that kind of thing. I'm very excited about parallel flight and the uh, hybrid work that you're doing with the realistic approach that fossil fuel is the way to put power um, to a rotor blade, uh, and, and we're excited for that. I, I do. I want bigger. I want farther. Um, the mobility advantage of flying over the terrain that we struggle to accomplish um, is a big deal for us. In that rapid initial attack, there are many places where that flow breaks down, and one of them is terrain and mobility. And, and the more I can carry over top of the trees and the hills and the, you know, the ravines that we have to get through, the better. Yeah, uh, that's 
That's that's huge, right? Like being able to get those supplies to the front line of the fire as quickly as possible, uh, you know, with without terrain hindering you. Um, just to just to put a um, uh, kind of bookend on the battery discussion, uh, you know, this is something that I've been pretty close to, uh, especially with my time at Tesla, um, where I really kind of got into it pretty deeply. And the thing that I can say pretty unequivocally is that battery technology moves a lot, moves very slowly. It doesn't move as fast as say computer technology where you have a doubling of processor power every 18 months. It's, it's nothing like that. I mean, even, even I would say 15 years ago, we were talking about, you know, when are we gonna have lithium air batteries that'll have the same energy density as gasoline? And we said, oh, well, we'll have them in 10 years. Well, we clearly didn't have them in 10 years. And I'd be, we, I would be surprised if we have them 10 years from now. It's just, it's, it's, it's much more of a physics problem and a, almost like a nano engineering problem than, than a typical uh, engineering problem. It's a, it's a really tough one. I, and I think it's gonna take a lot longer to solve than, than the world would like or, or need. But, um, you know, and that's why we've taken the very pragmatic approach that we've taken with hybridization. Um, okay, L what, what other questions do we wanna get to? Because we could talk about that one for hours. <laughs> um, I, I think this is a really good question. I'm sure all of you guys have some insight on this. So do you have an example of what a standard procedure regarding the deployment of the firefighting drones would be in a real-time firefighting situation from start to finish uh, at the first sign of an actual fire? Or is that what you're still dialing in on? Oh. So Go ahead. go ahead, Mark. No, no, go ahead. Um, so we don't currently have, we have drones that will do the prescribed burns. So we're, we're taking care of, you know, doing a lot in that area. We don't have the, the large drones yet that can respond 24 seven for the rapid initial attack. Um, we do have extensive, uh, we've extensively used drones, small drones for precision mapping, situational awareness. And so we had a fire in 2017 where drones spotted a hot spot behind the fire line, behind the firefighters and directed firefighters in there to put it out. Um, that was in Oregon. The uh, power company said it saved uh, $50 million in uh, uh, infrastructure value there. Uh, so uh, it's, fully integrated into the fire fighting teams uh, and uh, incident management teams. We have all sorts of policy and training on that. So I think it's really integrated in there and it's small, uh, but uh, right now we need to get to some of those larger ones that can provide not only that rapid initial attack, but also that sustained suppression. I think one of the things we run into a lot of times in the facilitation the adopt of the adoption of unmanned systems technology, specifically in the fire space, is, is a lot of people think very narrow, like, uh, you know, what is the standard procedure of a firefighting drone, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and no offense to the question asked, uh, but I always tell folks, think bigger. Drones can be used for a lot of things in the same 15 minutes, the same two hours. It could be a, hey, I need a radio battery. That's a Mavic, a DJI Mavic. Duct tape a battery to a Mavic and fly it to the person that needs it. There could be a, hey, I need, I need a 100 gallons of water or retardant. That's a drone job. Um, I'm out of gas for my chainsaw. That's a drone job. Um, I'm losing communication connection. Can you put a repeater in the sky for me over the incident? That's a drone job. I can't see over the hill, that's a drone job. Um, I need a map of the current incident, that's a drone job. There are so many things that that mobility advantage of a flying device brings uh, to the fight, if you will, that it's really a broad, there is no single standard procedure um, from a uh, drone perspective. I think in the future, and this is just like elevators, a lot of people don't realize that in some uh, fancy uh, hotels, you still have a, an elevator attendant. That's historic adoption or historic. Uh, the, the idea was that when, when we first had elevators, people were afraid to ride them. So what do we do? We put a human on there that rides them every day and becomes comfortable and, hey, we'll pay them to stay in there. And then that way, when you get on, you see a smiling face and they hit the button for you. 
it's not as if we needed somebody to push a button in an elevator for us, but that human face made us trust that. And now no one does that. We hop on an elevator and away we go. I think in the future, the firefighter says, I need to get over there. And he grabs, you know, a, a trapeze on a drone and it flies him over the, the ravine that we can't cross. I mean, there's things that we'll get to when we kind of bridge that trust safety threshold that we'll do with unmanned systems that we can't imagine right now. So, and, and again, back to bigger and carry more. Yeah, I, the, the, the future's bright when we can build systems that do that for us. Um, I, I think, so this is a, another good segue into a question. So to a fellow Coloradan, I have seen the devastations of forest fires. What other improvements can PFT make besides seeing through the smoke and fly time like GPS and terrain reading software? How, how do PFT drones compensate for thermal updrafts? Is this something to worry about? Yeah, that, th those are great questions. So there's we have a whole pipeline of technologies that we're planning on integrating, and we've already started doing a, a, a bunch of it. Um, of course, you know GPS is standard, right? So right now, uh, we you can lay out the entire mission from the ground control station, press go, and the aircraft will execute that mission. What it doesn't currently have integrated is uh, detect and avoid hardware and software. So it's relying on the GPS system to, to get from point A to point B. Uh, we have recently integrated a LIDAR system that gives you more information about the condition of the ground where you're gonna be landing. Um, and that obviously is very useful. Um, so, you know, that, that's another addition, right? Like LIDAR, obviously GPS, infrared to be able to see through things, long range communication. Right now our, our standard radio goes 60 kilometers. Um, and eventually we wanna uh, have a system that that's outfitted with an, an Iridium uh, sat link so that it can we, it can be controlled uh, from anywhere on earth to any other point on earth, which would be phenomenal. We saw a demonstration of that technology uh, recently and it was pretty amazing uh, where you can even get video feeds, um, nearly real-time video, video feeds from anywhere, anywhere on earth via Iridium. So that's something we're really excited about. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're just continuing to integrate uh, more and more advanced technologies so that we can accomplish these, you know, broad, broad missions. <clears throat> I hope that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, a question for Ben. Can you speak to resource availability and changes to year long fire seasons? How is building capacity in Colorado fire and fed fire resources elevated to decision makers and legislation to increase fire funding for first responders? Also, what is the status on 24 hour aviation availability for suppression? Yeah, I thank you, Sarah. And thanks for that question. I have to take a little side to point out that that was asked by the one and only Lance Brady um, from the National Uncrewed Systems Office with the United States Geological Survey. If, if we're a group of OGs in unmanned systems space, Lance is uh, part of that party. So uh, great question, a great Colorado question. Um, it's something that's very interesting in wildland response right now nationally. So uh, predominantly, for the most part, up until now in the last few years, in the case of Colorado, California, um, and some other states in the West, predominantly a federally uh, sourced um, solution. And now it's becoming a local source solution. In fact, um, the very legislation that created us was a result of a fire year that was very bad for Colorado. And one of the lessons learned was that access to federal resources in a timely fashion um, wasn't um, as good as it could have been. And so the answer was that the state decided, hey, we have funds, let's step in and begin to build state only, in a sense, resources. Um, and that's really where um, DFPC has come from. That's where Cal Fire has come from, et cetera. And the idea there is that the state is investing in firefighters, um, aircraft, fire trucks, uh, detection technologies, et cetera, that are on a kind of positioned within the state. There are a few resources that the governor does not allow us to send to other fires and low fire uh, times in the state of Colorado. 
Um, we have a wide gamut really from that detection to that suppression capability. Uh, we really step in, in the state of Colorado, the local fire organization, whether it's a, a full-time fire department, a career and or volunteer fire department to the local sheriff's office that has fire responsibility. As soon as it really exceeds that organization's capability, um, it falls to us. And then when it really exceeds ours, it falls to our federal partners. We bridge that gap as the federal resource um, uh, aircraft carrier, if you will, is on its way to the fire. Um, we're there uh, sooner than that, but with less resource. And so the the big army's on its way, and and the special forces guys are there, you know, preeminently, or you know, within time to be effective and kind of filling in some of those gaps in the chain, if you will. Um, I would tell you. In states like ours, um, from a state legislative perspective, um, we are one of the number one concerns for folks uh, in the state legislature and, and, and folks that have direct influence in state budgets. Um, and now we have, we don't have um, seasonal contracts to answer Lance's question a little bit more directly. We have uh, year-long contracts on aviation. So we we used to contract uh, helicopters for 120 days, and now we contract them for 240 days. Um, and we've purchased our own Firehawk helicopter, which is a, basically a fire-converted Blackhawk. Um, and that will be on duty 24-7, 365. Um, we have a fixed-wing aircraft that we now contract for double what we used to contract for. Um, and we really don't have a fire season. There's no such thing. Our, our, the last big fire that a lot of people know about in the state of Colorado, um, just recently we had one in Boulder, but before that was on December 29th, the Marshall Fire. Um, I mean, that shocked me even that, that, you know, a few days after Christmas, we had a major fire event in the state of Colorado. Um, so there's no such thing as a season anymore in a lot of states in the West. Um, and states are investing in um, fire uh, resources. Um, and then as far as night aviation, we're still very committed to looking at the opportunities to fight fire at night. Um, a couple of our aircraft are fire uh, night qualled. We have a night fire program. Um, they run buckets where they sling a bucket underneath the helicopter and dip from um, water locations and put fire or put water on the ground um, in fire situations. Obviously, Mark put it uh, perfectly, we, the fire has a disadvantage at night, and so we're looking to capitalize on that opportunity. Um, that's going to be a hard one to crack There's for a lot of reasons, technology, culture, et cetera, um, but we're definitely interested in that. I think we're taking the all of the above approach. Mark, do you have any uh, insight or anything to add from a legislation perspective? Uh, no, I'm, I'm very um, pleased with the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's a lot of money that's uh, come out of the federal level fire. The, the uh, wildfire commission that uh, they're selecting members for, uh, that's another indication of uh, at least a, you know, at the federal level, the emphasis on this. I would just say that it, it, you know, firefighting is a, is, a, is a team effort and not just, not just at the federal level. It needs a state, it needs a local. You know, at, at the end of the day, fire is very local in its impact, and it's important that communities at every level get involved, in, you know, in, um, in the legislative process and the policy process and, and, you know, making sure they have what they need to uh, prevent those fires if possible and then to deal with them uh, when they happen. That's great. Um, so we are at the hour. Um, I just want to give Joshua a minute to add anything. Well, I want to thank uh, Mark and Ben uh, very sincerely for joining us and for making this possible, not just joining us, right? Like you made this possible. So thank you for, um, for doing that and, and sparing the time. I want to thank all of our participants for hopping on the call. Um, and also this, you know, I, I don't want this to sound like a shameless plug. It's more just, I want to let people know that there is an opportunity to invest in parallel flight. We've been funded, uh, almost exclusively through crowdfunding from our very, um, from our, from our inception, we've raised over $8 million through crowdfunding. This has been a kind of a remarkable, uh, success for our company. 
Uh, we've also uh, are, are tirelessly working on federal grants. We've, we're on our fourth SBIR right now. We're on a phase two SBIR from the USDA. And this is money that comes in uh, from the federal government to do fundamental research. And then once the fundamental part is done, you know, to, to then uh, deploy that for practical applications. And, you know, we, we work really hard on getting these grants so that we have this non-diluting capital coming into the company, which is, you know, a way of, that we give back also to all of our investors. Um, and uh, our phase two that we're working on right now is for large scale prescribed fire. And we're really looking forward to demonstrating that uh, this year uh, with our with our par partner Drone Amplified. So I'm super excited about uh, that work. And um, you know, obviously, we'll let everybody know about it. But uh, thank you, Mark and Ben, for for making this possible, for sharing your knowledge with our audience. And uh, thanks everybody for joining and asking great questions. We'll make this recording available. And uh, I hope I, I know that I learned a lot uh, during the process of putting this together and during the the discussion today, and I hope that everybody uh, is going to walk away more knowledgeable than they were when they came. So thank you. Absolutely. And if we didn't get a chance to answer your questions, we'll be following up on those. Like Joshua said, this recording will be available. So again, thank you, Mark, Joshua, and Ben for such a, a thought-provoking discussion and Looking forward to the next time that we get to bring the three of you together. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your day and we will see you soon. Thanks everyone.